Good morning. So blessed to see everyone this morning. Let's begin our service by singing together hymn number 30. Hymn number 30. For those that can and will, please stand as we sing together all hail the power of Jesus' name. <clears throat> All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown Seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Tell him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Tell him who saves you by his grace and crown. Remain standing now for the invocation. Heavenly Father, we do indeed know that you are our King and King eternal. And Father Lord, we crown you every day of our life by the way we live. We're trusting in you, trusting in you for every day and everything that we have. And all that we have is because you gave it to us. Father, I thank you, dear God, for being King eternal. I pray to your God, Lord, that you'd bless the folks to, today that made it out to your house. Father, give us a wonderful, wonderful service. May everything that's said and done bring glory and honor to you, because you're the only one that's worthy. Now, Father, I pray to your God that you'd bless the service, the singing, the preaching, and uh, Father, Lord, bless as it goes out over the airways, and Father, Lord, that somebody might come to know Christ as their Savior. That, Father, is what we're here for, is to win souls and bring people close to you. Father, I pray, Lord, you just have your way in the service. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Amen. Everybody glad to be here this morning? Amen. amen. I'd rather be here than the best hospital or the worst jail in, in, in the world that, uh, than to be here with my family. Thank you for praying for me this week and look forward to having a wonderful service today. Brother Jack, would you come and sing? It's always good to have friends. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's open our hymnals to 589 and sing together. What a friend we have in Jesus. <clears throat> Everything to God in prayer. 
God peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear Oh, because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations is that trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? sorrow share. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Comfort with the Lord of care. Shall save your still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for friend like Jesus. Amen. Nobody can come close to him. I'm so glad that in the wee hours of the night, in the morning, we can talk to him if we need to, in the middle of the day, wherever we're at, he's always listening. I thank God for that blessing. Thank you for giving the, this year like you have and you continue to do so. We thank God for the finances that comes in and so we can get the gospel out around here and around the world. So ushers, if you would, come and uh, take our Sunday morning off. Brother Harry. Amen. Brother Harry, you and Sister Becky come.
like a bird in prison I dwell No freedom from my sorrow I fell But Jesus came and listened to me And glory to God He set me free He set me free Yes, He set me free And He broke the bonds of prison Son sets free is free indeed. No charge against us anymore. We, are, it's, it's, we never sinned because He set us free from, from our sin. He set us free from the Satan and from, from all of our self, selfish ideas. And He's given us a home in heaven. Brother Jack and uh, Sister Deborah, would you come? Pray for us as we sing, Gone. Gone. Mary came unto the tomb of Jesus. The stone was moved and he had gone. say 
way too late. Gone, the stone is rolled back, gone, the tomb is empty, gone, to sit at the Father's side. Gone, over death triumph. Get your wings ready. We're going to fly away, okay? Amen. I'll fly away. You may remain seated if your wings don't get you up. And your spirit moves you to fly. Amen. Amen. I'll fly away. 648. Some glad morning when this life is calls us, we'll fly away. Amen. We won't be limited to this earth any longer, and we won't Already even... Got the tickets. Amen. 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 We won't need a rocket ship, a spaceship. We're going to sail on past the moon and the stars and the sun to meet the sun, S-O-N, and his Father. Go with me this morning to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 4. Talk about hidden treasures and hidden light this morning. Let's read the first seven verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of, of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, condemning, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid by them that are lost. To whom the God of this world hath blinded the eyes, blinded the minds of them which believe not, 
lest the glorious, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves the servants for Christ's sake. For God, who commended his light to shine out of darkness, hath shined it in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may, power may be of God and not of us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house today to preach the word of God, to study the word of God, to Lord lift you up in any way always possible. And Father Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd let us do that today. Father Lord, would you just bless us richly in Christ Jesus. May we sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus today. Father Lord, may we learn from the word of God. May we learn from the life of Paul. Father Lord, how we as Christian people, believers should be living and in, in what we should be doing. Now, Father Lord, have your way, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Keep your Bibles and note, or notes open there, and we'll probably look at some of the whole chapter before we finish. But some of the people in Corinth, the church at Corinthians, the biggest majority of those were very liberal. It was a very liberal church, a very material-oriented church, a very money-sensitive church. They focused more on the outward than they did the inward. And they got upset when Apostle Paul came to preach for them and preach to them in the years that he was there. And so they began to accuse Paul. If you go back and read a couple of chapters prior, they began to, to accuse Paul of being in the ministry just because he could get out something out of it. Or in the ministry just to get something out of it, maybe it would be the best way to put it. And certainly we knew the accusation was not right. We know that today. But uh, sad to say that most, a lot, a good many of the churches today are like that. A good many of ministers are in the ministry for gain, for personal gain. There are a lot of good churches that, that are in it for the same reason. But Paul definitely was not in it, and most good pastors today are not in it for the money, or churches that are not in it for the money. But no preacher, no teacher, no deacon, no true Christian would ever want that to be an accusation said about them. I certainly don't want anybody to think that your pastor is in it for what I can get out of it. And I don't want to think that about any of you. I think every member of this church is here for the glory of God, to give him glory, to serve him and honestly and, and uh, completely by giving forth the gospel and living accordingly. True Christians do what we do, not for self-gain, but because God has called every one of us into to doing his work, doing his work for his glory, and for his blessings, and, and the true blessings of doing what we do is exactly what the ministry of God has called us to do with no fleshly profits, with no fleshly desires, other than to do nothing other than what's laid down in Scripture. We should not be here for any other reason. If you come to church to be seen, you might as well stay home. If you come to be church to be bragged about and and pat it on the back, what good job you do, and however, whatever it is, you might as well stay home. You have your rewards. But we do what we do because, because of the Word of God, because He tells us what we need to do, and we do it accordingly. Our reward, our blessing, our, our, our payday is to see lost sinners saved and then to see them grow in the Word of God. Yes. To see lost sinners saved. Don't ever forget, that's the reason this church exists. It's not for me to be your pastor or you to be members. It's that we need to be existing today 
in order to giving out, giving out the, 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 the gospel uh, here in this place and then all, all over the world where it, where it is sent. But the evidence of, of Paul's ministry he gives real clearly. Not that he needed to, not that he needed to uh, promote himself or to clear himself. Not that he needed to brag or boast about himself and the evidence of his ministry. But that God might be glorified. You see, we don't have to defend ourselves because Jesus won the battle at Calvary. We don't have to, have to sit there and defend ourselves if we know we're called of God. Whether we're called of God just to be a member of a church or a singer or a preacher or a teacher or a deacon, a lay speaker or a leader or whatever, we don't need to defend ourselves when we do according to the Word of God. Now, if we leave the Word of God, then we might need somebody to defend us or we need to defend ourselves. But not that Paul needed to defend himself. He just wanted to clarify things about him, his ministry. First of all, in the evidence that was put forth by Paul concerning his ministry, we see his determination in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Somebody gave Paul that ministry. He didn't earn it. Even though Paul was a very astute gentleman, very knowledgeable, Scholar says he could preach, he, he could speak fluently in six languages and, and little and more. He didn't need anybody to give him a ministry. He already had it because Jesus Christ. Let me say this. If God calls a man to the ministry, then he, he best go and people should take note of him and understand what they're doing and, and knowing that, that they're not doing it for self-gain, but for God's glory. Let me ask you this. Who or why would Paul want to keep on preaching with all the dangers and, and, and all the trials and toils that it involved if he was not sincere? i tell you what. I tell young men when they call me about going into ministry, or anybody who talks about going into this ministry, if you can do anything else, go do it. But if you can't, then follow God completely and get into the ministry he's called you to. The calling of God is a necessity in any, any man's ministry. A man of lesser, of, of lesser mo, uh, motives or less spiritual view of the, of the ministry would have given up a long time before Paul did. But Paul believed God. He knew who he had trusted. He knew who he had given his life to. And he knew who was blessing him. Paul looked on his ministry as a stewardship. And certainly we are stewards of God's word. God gave it to him and God always would give him strength and to continue and not faint. His ministry came straight from God. Look at Philippians 3.13 and 14. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended. We have not finished yet, is what he's saying. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm not finished with what God wants me to do. I think too many people finish themselves or think they're finished before God's finished with them. We need to be careful that we don't quit while, while, the, while, while the power of God is running in our lives and in the ministry. We need to be determined. Thank God we can be determined and have determination to keep on keeping on for him. Let me say this. If you don't determine to serve God, you'll never serve him. If you don't make a determination to be the teacher, the preacher, the singer, the deacon, or whatever it is that God has called you to, you'll never be successful. We need to make up our mind 
what we're going to be for God and who we're going to be for God and, and, and allow him to move in and through us. You see, I can't do anything by myself. But the word of God says that through Jesus Christ, I can do all things. I can do all things through Jesus Christ. I cannot be a success, neither can you, without the power of the Holy Spirit living in our lives. We'd be just like we were before we got saved. If, unless we determine our, ourselves to live for God. So by his determination, and nothing ever, nothing ever caused Paul to quit. He was still giving the gospel when he got to Rome and through, through Rome and through circular, secular history of the church, we find that he had many converts in Rome. Even to the highest people that ruled that area came to know Christ as their savior. But not only do we see his determination, but we see something that many preachers and teachers and churches overlook is the fact that of that of honesty, that of being honest. But we have renounced, to, to verse 2 through 4, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, of walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, to whom the God of this world, by Satan, the devil, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine through, or should shine unto them. He was honest. He was honest. Honest beyond reproach. He was careful to take care of his business and God's business as well. Paul was a tip maker. And according to, to uh, church history, Paul was one of the greatest tent makers ever there was. Honest. But he had decided some things. Paul had decided to refuse to do some things. He refused to be underhanded. He refused to be deceitful in practice just to gain followers, just to gain people to go with him. False teachers were doing it, those, those very same things that they accused him of there. But why, one version of scripture says, why do we want to trick people into believing? You see, Paul was very careful. Preachers and churches ought to be as careful as well to not be deceitful and underhanded just to get people to come to church, to, to not allow practices of sin or anything goes in the church. Folks, I think when we get to heaven and we look down the roll of heaven and see who's there and see whose churches are represented, I think there's going to be a lot of churches whose name is never there. I think there'll be a lot of Christians whose name was never there because they compromised and they used deceitful matters and means to get people to come to the house of God to be followers. Paul would not walk in the craftiness or use the word of God deceitfully. And that is by altering the word of God. You see, there's a warning that God gives us. And he says this in, the, in, in Revelation, the last chapter. That if we change the word of God, if we abandon scripture's truth and change the word of God to make it sound like what we want, then we are guilty of everything that's in that book and we're under the wrath of God. Let me say this. True Christians will never do that. True believers will never change the word of God. You see, you say, Pastor, I have some things in there I don't like. There's some things I don't like either. Some things walk on my feet before they ever get to my heart. The biggest complaint that I've had in my ministry is that you use too much ministry, you use too much scripture. And sometimes it gets to me. That's exactly the point that we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to people's hearts and their minds and change their lives for Jesus Christ. But we don't need to use trickery in any means. We handle the word of God deceitfully. 
when we mix philosophy and in order to in, in, with an era with God's truth in order to win human approval. I'm afraid too many preachers are going down the wrong road of trying to soothe out the gospel. I tell you what, there's some things about the gospel that, and something about the practices that we preach and, and we have as, as Christian people today that don't, people, some people don't like. But I believe the word of God is still true. I don't think we need to mix philosophies and cultures. I read something the other day but one of our preachers that said, one of our free will Baptist preachers, that said too many churches have tried to reach the culture but the culture is reaching the church. Too many churches are trying to change the culture but the culture is changing the church. Let me say this. When we go after the culture in which we're living in, and when we go after them because we have because we have abandoned truth, and we let them come in and, and we let the world come in and, and guide the church, then we lost the church. I'll tell you, the church should have more effect on culture than culture has on the church. Amen. Amen. Paul. No one could, would, no, uh, not, not so with Apostle Paul. He, his ministry was one of honesty. He used the word of God in an open and sincere way to encourage people to search the scriptures for themselves. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 says this concerning the Berean believers. These were, the Bereans, more noble than those in Thessalonica, because when they had received the word uh, with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Listen, I would never mislead you. I'd rather die than mislead you. I'd rather leave this world than mislead anybody concerning truth of the word of God. But we must be careful. We must always be honest. We must never give ourselves over to somebody, what somebody else says. I've told you many times before, I'll tell you this again, when, when we came here, I've made you uh, some promises. One of them was to never change the word of God. Not to handle the word of God deceitfully. But to give ourselves to Christ for his using never to twist or corrupt the word of God. We must handle the word of God in good conscience towards every person, every man. May God help us, you and I, as a church, to always be honest and honest towards him. Next we see not only his ministry, his honesty, but we see his humility. We see the humbleness of Apostle Paul. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in hidden vessels, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of power may be of God and not of us. Listen to this. Paul, if, if, if Paul wanted to gain followers to himself, wanted to make a name for himself, then he would have preached of himself instead of Christ. Amen? He would have preached Paul. He would preach the gospel of Paul. He would preach the messages from Paul. But he didn't. He wanted to give praise and honor to glory. Paul presented himself as a servant or a slave for Jesus' sake. No, there can't be any, there, there, there can be no light if it exalts men. But God alone and cause the light to shine out of our hearts into the darkness. The Lord God says, 
and they that sit in great darkness have seen the great light. Paul says, I saw the light, and it's in my heart. It's, my, it's in my being. It's in my body. But I don't want you to think that this light's coming from me. I don't want you to think that this word is coming from me. I don't want you, what Paul was saying, I don't want you to think about me. Because if you think about me, we exalt me. If you think about you as being somebody special, somebody powerful, then you're exalting yourself. But we are to be servants and slaves for God, for Christ's sake. And he says, this gospel, this gospel I'm preaching is the light that we have in us Then God works through us to bring the light to the light of the world. You can choose light or you can choose darkness. Light is salvation. Darkness is damnation. The lost sinner's heart, the unredeemed heart, is just like the original earth. It was void. It had no substance. It had no light. It had nothing until Jesus Christ spoke light into being. Light into light. Spoke the light. Spoke into the, this darkness. Light. He spoke of himself. Into a place that was empty and void. Do you remember when your heart was empty and void? When you were living in darkness of this world, darkness of satanic leadership, you say, Pastor, why do you use those terms like satanic leadership? Because all of us were lost. And if you're lost, you're led around by satanic leadership until you know the great leader, until he comes into your heart and changes your heart, until Jesus comes in. And it's when he comes in, the word brings the light and the light of the glorious gospel. And there in the center becomes a new creation. It starts bringing fruit in for the glory of God. Paul says, yes, he admits that we have a treasure. But it is in an earthen vessel that he doesn't want to be seen. Paul says, I'm just the vessel. What's important is what's in the vessel. I'm going to tell you this morning, we're just simply vessels of God. What's important is how much light we have, how much treasure we have. God could have sent angelic beings to proclaim the gospel, to give forth the light, but he didn't choose to. He chose men who were made, men and women who was made in his likeness, who was made from dust, who was made from nothing. There's not much anything less nothing than dust. Than dust. But Paul chose, or God chose, to use us in earthen vessels, in dusty vessels, in vessels of clay, to give for the light but we need to be, still need to be hid in the vessel of clay. You see, we're that vessel, and the vessel in itself can't do anything. Imagine this was a beautiful piece of pottery. I mean, a beautiful piece of pottery. But what we wanted was not that pottery, but what's inside. That's exactly what the lost world was looking for. And this pottery... Is beautiful. And people can see the beauty of the pottery and wonder and want that pottery. But you see, we're potter's clay. We've been put on the wheel of the potter. And we've been molded and made in the likeness of Christ. But we as the pottery don't want to be seen. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a piece of Pottery that's worth five million dollars or five dollars. It's what's inside that's important. It's what's inside. 
You see, it's not important who we are, but the treasure that we have. The greatest treasure in the world is the gospel of Christ. The greatest light that's ever been shown is the light of the glorious gospel. It's not about us, the vessel. It's about God and God the Son. We should never want to be seen for our work. We should never want to be praised for our work. We should never desire the praise of man. We always should desire the leadership of God and giving forth his treasure. Next we see his suffering. We see the suffering of Paul. Look in verse 8 through 10. We are troubled on every hand, on every side, but yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of also of Jesus might be made manifest in the body. Paul says, why in the world would me or anybody else be in this for personal gain as much as we have to suffer for Christ? Why would we seek personal gain? We as Christians don't seek personal gain. We as believers don't seek personal gain, but we want to give what we have away for Jesus. That's the gospel. Freely given to us, and we freely give to all men. You see, a man that compromises the word of God will never suffer. Men who are like that will be welcomed and honored and, and given high accusations. But people were abusing Paul, rejecting him, making it more difficult for him to have the ministry. They were treating him the same way they treated Jesus. Let me say this. If you are being persecuted or suffered for Christ, and it may be in your own home, it may be by your spouse, or it may be by your children, it may be by your parents. Persecution runs in all, in all families, in all stages of life sometimes. But if you're in for it, and it for Christ, a little suffering is not going to hurt. We suffer with Christ. Look at, look at his life. Go through the word of God and look at how Paul was treated and then see if we can complain. I can't complain one bit about what God's done in my life and is doing in my life and what I believe he's going to do even if we have to suffer a little bit for him. May God allow us to suffer with him that we might be glorified together. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and join heirs with Christ if so, that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. What's that saying? It says when he comes in glory, we're going to see a part of the rejoicing. We're going to be part of that crowd of people that were faithful to the end, and we will give him glory and honor. May God give us the strength to suffer with him. And then fifthly, we see his faith. Look in 16 through 18. For which cause we faint not, that though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. For the light affliction, but is but a moment, worketh the far exceedingly weight of eternal glory. While we took, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that we are not seen are eternal. His faith was what led him on. His faith. You see, by faith we can please God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we, Paul had his blessings because he believed in faith. But let me just say this, as, as he looked at this, and it says that, the light of affliction is but for a moment, worketh more exceedingly in an eternal weight of glory. Paul looked at this on the scales of God's blessings, on God's scales. He looked at the suffering and weighed out the, the, the cost. 
He discovers that the suffering are, are light when compared to the glory that awaits us in heaven. The suffering on this earth is very light compared to the, to the glory that is eternal with us in heaven. His days, his years of trial was nothing concerning what he was going to receive when he saw his Savior. I personally believe that when we see, when we see Jesus, when we look into his majesty and his glory and into his bright and beautiful face, even with the marks of the crowns of thorns, even with the piercing of his hands by the nails, when we see his face, we're going to say it's worth it all. Amen. What a blessing. What a weight of eternal glory. That never ends. We'll always, throughout the ceaseless ages of time, time without end, through eternity, we will always be looking at him and say, I'm so glad that I've done what I've done and followed the leadership of Christ. Oh, the world thinks we're crazy. The world thinks we're stupid, that we're ignorant because we dare to believe the word of God and, and give accordingly to his will. We should covet no man's goods, no man's property, but we should work hard for God and covet his faith. May we always live by faith in Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. You ever feel like quitting? You ever feel like giving up? Sure. You ever question why God called us to do what he called us? Sure. And it'd be so easy to give up. But I tell you what, when people give up living for God, they miss a lot of blessings. They miss great blessings. How important is it that you follow God? How important is it that we be a sincere Christian and sincere in the word of God and sincere in the ministry? Our motives must be true. Our hearts must be pure. Our motives, our methods must be scriptural. And we must be true to the word of God. Paul had this kind of ministry. And I pray to God that we do too. But that's the reason that we're here, is to win souls for Christ, to win followers for him and not for us. Not for us. You see, what's not important is the name over the door, Free Will Baptist. What's important is those Free Will Baptists who are in earthen vessels. We, we free will Baptists, who are in earthen vessels, know where our ministry comes from, knows who it's about. And it's more important that the people of this community know that that free will Baptist church loves God. But they love us. We're getting ready to replace the sign out front, the banner out front that says we love our neighbors. Why? Because that was all faded and it don't really say what it should. But we can really put a new one up that says, we love our neighbors in the big red heart. Let me ask you this. Do we love our neighbors? As a church, as an individual believer, do we love our neighbors? I'm constantly making people upset around us. Because we asked, I asked them a question. Are you saved? Tell me about your salvation. Gone is the days of knocking on doors because people won't let you in. But still here are the days of attendance to the house of God, to prayer, to Bible study, to faithfulness. That we might be faithful and true in all that we do for God and his glory. Brother Jack. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you give us the pleasure and the privilege of being in your house. Father, Lord, great is the honor that we have to be representing you in our lives and in our church. 
and the people around us. Lord, help us to be faithful in doing so. In Christ's name, amen. Brother Jack.